Good evening. Thank you for coming. I'm going to keep this introduction short because I want to get to talking to Melissa. Um, as you know, for 28 days, Melissa Fung disappeared from all of us as uh, there was a flurry of activity to try to find out where she was and get her out of there. Um, we never knew what was happening to her until she got out. And um, even though we work for the same corporation and we had emailed a bit, I'd never actually met Melissa until I met her in Dubai a couple of days after she was released. Um, Melissa is a journalist's journalist. She cares about the story. She goes to places to talk to people, not so she can tell you what happened to her on the way there or tell you what she thinks they think, but so that she can give them voice. And that's what she was doing in Afghanistan the day that she was kidnapped. Um, what really struck me about Melissa when, she, when I met her was that um, she still didn't want to talk about Melissa. She wanted to talk about the people she had been reporting on and the people that she was in the midst of doing a story on that never went to air. And that was her great regret uh, about the 28 days. And um, so rather than me talk more about her, I'd like to just introduce Melissa Fung. Please come up here and let's get talking. Let's just begin with that assignment. Why did you go to Afghanistan? I'd been the year before and um, really liked the Afghans that I was able, the everyday Afghans that I was able to to meet there and talk to and, and the women and you know I did the story the first year on a bunch of girls playing soccer for the first time. Like girls playing soccer in a stadium where they used to behead women. So those were the kinds of stories that I wanted to tell and I just wanted to tell more. I mean every assignment, every tour of Afghanistan is only about five or six weeks, um, which is really not enough time to really get to know a story and, and a country. So I wanted to go back. So more than two years have passed. What stays with you now about that time after you were grabbed, that, those 28 days? What lingers for you? That's a good question. I think it all lingers. It, you know, the whole, it feels a bit surreal sometimes. I still don't think that, you know, it happened to me. That it, you know, even writing the book, it didn't feel like it was, it could have happened to me, right? Like it just doesn't feel real still for some reason. I don't know, that's that not a good answer, but. Uh, I think any answer is a good answer. <laughs> um, it's your answer. No, I'm always afraid I'm not answering the question because I know that when somebody's not answering a question, I'll, I'll tell them <laughs> you're not answering my question. <laughs> so I want to make sure. <laughs> well, take us through what happened that day. You were at a refugee camp. I was at a refugee camp just outside of Kabul. Um, and it was this, the summer of 2008 was especially bad for fighting in the south, in the provinces of Kandahar, Helmand, and Erzgan. And a lot of people had fled the south and moved north, taken as many belongings as they could and set up home in these refugee camps that were growing and growing and growing. And it was a story that really not many Western journalists had told. Um, I had, I think, heard about it through a, a UN contact I had, and she said, you know, you've got to come and do the story because it's a, it, these are people from Kandahar, right? This is the effect of what is happening down there, and, and they, they're left with nothing. So that was, that was why I went to do the story, and we had spent about 45 minutes at the camp interviewing families. Um, I talked to a woman who had lost her husband and three children um, in the fighting. I talked to a guy who was a, he was a shoemaker, but yet his feet were caked with mud. Um, he had, his business um, was destroyed in a, a bombing. So that's why they were, that's why they were there. They'd moved, they had nowhere else to go. 
So we were there for about 45 minutes and I was saying to our fixer Shakur, um, time to go, um, we need to you know, talk to the UN person. We'd run into them during the course of our interviews at the camp. And um, I said, it's, yeah, it's time to go. We'll you know, grab that UN interview. And then we were supposed to shoot another story that afternoon. So as our, on our way back to the car, um, that's when this other car just drove up in a cloud of dust. And these men came out. What'd they do? They had guns. Um, remember them pointing guns at Shakur? I was afraid they would kill him. And guns at me. And they were trying to shove me into the car. Um, I, I reacted by punching one in the nose. And he reacted by stabbing me in the shoulder. So that didn't really work out too well. <laughs> they got me in the car. End of story. You were on the floor, right? You didn't know where you were going. I didn't know where I was going. Like they were, you know, trying to keep me covered up in case somebody had called the police, in case somebody at the camp had seen them. Um, so they were driving as fast as they can, I imagine, just outside of the city and, and trying to keep me covered up with my, my scarf, their coats, on the floor of the back of the car. They would eventually take you to a place that had a hole in the ground. Um, when you saw that, how did you react? There's no way I'm going in there. There's no frigging way I am going in there. I mean, it was a hole in the ground. That's where they said, that's your room. That's where you're going to be. So what'd they do? One of them picked me up and dropped me in. So in I went. I didn't this, really have a choice, right? This was how long after you'd been taken? A couple of hours? I would say it was night. So it was probably five or six, uh, no, longer than that, seven or eight. It was about eight o'clock at night, I think. When I, I've got to refer to the book now because I can't remember a lot of the details, but um, it was late at night when they finally got me into the hole. Okay, so, um, and you're still defiant. I, I'm just like, you're, you're being, you're taken by people you don't know. They've stabbed you and they're about to throw you in a hole. Give us an idea of what is running through your mind in those hours. You don't know who they are. I was in shock, I think, you know? Like, and I remember thinking that I should try to escape. Because they, they took me on this big, long hike, um, just sort of through the mountains to, to get to this village where the hole was. And I remember thinking, I should try to escape. Like, I should run away because, you know, I'm a runner and I'm, uh, you know, I'm pretty fast when I want to be. But I was bleeding, right? So I'd lost a lot of blood. And, you know, halfway through the hike, I remember feeling really weak like I can't even how can I run when I can barely walk another you know another step so I don't know my judgment might have been clouded by being in shock and having lost blood I still don't know why I didn't try to run but you wouldn't have known where to run to either no and they had guns yeah <laughs> so they threw you down a hole describe that hole what was it like what did it how big was it I get, I've been asked this so many times, and the dimensions of the hole, are, I still have trouble, you know, describing it because it's smaller than most of our closets, right? Like, I don't have a big walk-in closet at home. Um, but it's really, I'm, what, five foot three, to, to be generous? Um, it was maybe the five foot five. Um, it was maybe six, six feet in length and another four and a half feet wide. It was like, it was a hole. It was, it was a hole. It was dirt walls. Um, they had a couple of beams. And a vent, right? Some kind of vent? Two pipes that they had sort of like poked in to let air in. And they would keep you in that hole for most of those 28 days. Um, 
T tell us a little bit more then when you, you, you go down and you can see how big it is, you can see how trapped you are. Take us through what you would have been thinking. There's no way I can spend another minute in here. You know, not another minute. Couldn't even think of spending another day, right? I had to sort of try to find a way out, you know, so I, but I didn't, but I didn't know how, so I don't know. And at this point, they had taken pretty well everything you had with you, right? Yeah, I had um, my, my knapsack, my camera bag. Thankfully, Shakur had the camera, so they didn't have that. Um, my notebook, my, ra my radio equipment, my Marantz. Um, I had a microphone. That was about, yeah, that was about all I had with me. My passport, my wallet, which didn't have much money in it. They didn't leave you there alone? No, they always had somebody with me, um, at least for the first three weeks, because they said I'm a woman and they didn't want me to scream or call for help. Um, they wanted, yeah, they felt like I had to have a guard. So tell us about these captors, because they took turns guarding you. Who, who were these guys? How many of them were there? I don't know how many in total was in the gang. I maybe saw five or six of them, but I knew, I knew there were more. Um, I mean, they were just kids, I think, many of them. A few were older, but the main kidnapper was just a kid. He was maybe 18 or 19 years old. He what was, was the guy his name? Khaled. Okay. Spelled with a K. K-H. And he was alternately friendly and menacing? He was mostly friendly. I would say that for the first three weeks, he was, fr I got to know him. He was friendly. He told me about, you know, that's why I think he's a kid. I still call him that, right? Because he's, <laughs> you know, 18 or 19 years old. He's not unlike in many ways, some of the 18, 19 year old Canadian kids I know, my cousins, you know, like just had a girlfriend who he was in love with, wasn't sure that his dad would approve of. You know, so he was telling me all, all this stuff and we, you know, so I got to know him pretty well. He wasn't, he didn't become menacing until the third week, the fourth week. He, uh, who else was down there? There was a man named Shafir Gula. Shafir Gula, mm -hmm. he was the one that stabbed me. He had beady eyes, I didn't trust him. And he didn't speak very good English, so we, you know, there wasn't much that we could, wasn't much conversation. You're down in this little space with these guys and they're actually, they're there with you 24 hours at a time? Yes. And how are you eating? What do you, what, like, are they giving you food? What are they doing? They're giving me, I mostly ate cookies. You know, those cream filled sandwich cookies. Never touched one since. Um, <laughs> juice from boxes. Um, occasionally rice. Occasionally an apple. Um, you and French fries. Them. French fries. Hallad brought me French fries because he found out one day that I loved French fries. All my friends will attest to this. Um, but he came in with a bag, newspaper wrapped. He was so proud. Look, look, I brought you chips. You know, it's interesting. You describe it's almost like you're, it's almost benign in some ways, but it was, it, you know, you were kidnapped. And you're down there in this little space with these men who keep changing the guard. You're not eating well. Oh, was there an, like light? You, you describe a little bit of light, but they were running on... The, little... the first night there was a, like a, I think it was an old car battery, and it jerry-rigged to a light bulb. But the battery must have been out of juice because that light bulb ran out after a day. So they, then they brought in an oil lamp. Um, which really polluted the, I mean, the, it was polluted enough, but it really gave off a lot of smoke. Um, and then they figured that wasn't a good idea because Shafir Gala, the guy with the beady eyes, was coughing a lot. So then they brought in a battery-operated sort of fluorescent lamp. You tried to talk to these guys. You were almost interviewing them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why were you doing that? 
trying to find out what motivated them, trying to find out what was going on inside their head, trying to find out a little bit about who they were and whether or not, you know, I could put any faith that I could get, that I'd get out of this alive. Really, it was trying to figure out what they were doing, what they were after. You know, what would they tell you? Why did they take you? Who did they say they were? What did they want from you? Well, originally they said they were Taliban, but it became pretty obvious to me that they were not that organized. I mean, I don't doubt that they, you know, had they were Taliban sympathizers, but I don't. They, they were not. They were not the politically organized Taliban that we that organized so many so much chaos um, in Afghanistan. Definitely not because they were they didn't even have a video camera, you know, to make a tape of me. Like they used a cell phone camera, the first, and then it went nowhere. And so I, I'm pretty I'm still pretty sure, and I know now after my release that they they were a gang of thugs. Some of them did have connections to the Taliban and they always threatened that they would sell me to the Taliban um, but they were not Taliban themselves. That's not to say they didn't have fundamentalist beliefs because they did. And so how would you get through a day not knowing really what they were up to and being so vulnerable down in that hole? I prayed a lot. I had, they let me keep my little, um, I'm kind of a lapsed Catholic, um, but I carry a little rosary, um, just a little tiny finger rosary. So I prayed a lot, um, wrote in my journal, wrote letters to my friends, just to try to keep sane, right? Just to try to imagine that my, my life was my normal life, even though I was in this awful, dank space. It was the only way I could. And were you aware of the days passing? Did you actually know what was going on or did it become a blur? Um, there was a clock, a little alarm clock, a plastic alarm clock, so I was aware of the passage of time for sure. Um, and then I made a calendar. Right, like I knew that I had, you know, I was at the camp on this day, and and so, but I think I gave October only 30 days, so the calendar got a little. The um, the people who came down to guard you, um, you talk about Shafir Gula who had stabbed you. One of them, I think it might have been him too, took some of the jewelry you had. No, it was, was Abdul Rahman. Uh, Abdul Rahman took your jewelry. Yeah, Abdul Rahman was also the man who um, who attacked you one night. Yep. What happened? Um, I'm not going to go into detail about what happened. I didn't in the book, and I still don't want to talk about what happened so much because it's still really hard to talk about, and there's some stuff that I still need to work out. But he assaulted me. Um, he held a knife to my throat and, and assaulted me. And then went to sleep. You don't say a lot about it in the book, but I was struck that Khalid, who um, was confiding in you, actually figured out that something had happened. And he became very protective of you. He did. Abdul Rahman never came back to the hole after that night, ever, except to, you know, send stuff down the pipes. So I, I really, in that way, do feel like Halid had, was concerned about me. I wouldn't say had my best interests, which is what I was going to say, but I, no, he, I really felt like he was trying to protect me a bit. I, I was really struck by that because it's almost, um you don't know who your captors are, you don't know how they'll treat you, and then this one man decides that he, he becomes angry about what one of his colleagues does. He calls you his sister, and he promises you that he will protect you. Yeah, he promised me he wouldn't kill me and that nobody else would hurt me while I was in the hole, while I was in his custody anyway. <laughs> 